systematic violence and intimidation against exiles and diaspora. A pro-democracy group names countries attempting to silence dissidents beyond their borders. The 34th African Union Summit. In a virtual meeting, African leaders call for a better, more resilient Africa in the wake of COVID-19. And US President Joe Biden promises to rebuild America's relationship with Africa. Hello and thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Chamberlain Osawa, Channel's television here in Lagos. I'm joined by my colleague from Voice of America in Washington. Thanks. I'm Vincent McCorry at the Voice of America in Washington. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Now, due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, our broadcast looks a little different for now. We appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Chamberlain Oso in Lagos brings you that story. African leaders are calling for a better, more resilient Africa post-COVID-19. Well, this call was made at the two-day virtual 34th Ordinary Session of the Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the African Union. The summit comes as U.S. President Joe Biden promises to rebuild America's relationship with Africa. The 34th Ordinary Session of the Assembly of the African Union kicked up virtually on Saturday, February the 6th, amid COVID-19 concerns and a joint commitment in the fight against the pandemic. The AU summit was held under the theme of arts, culture and heritage, levers for building the Africa we want. Outgoing President Cyril Ramaphosa told the virtual opening session that the AU has made huge progress in fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic and in sustainable development. He also praised the African continental free trade area, which commenced on January the 1st this year, saying that the agreement will promote the economic development of the continent after the pandemic. Meanwhile, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta says it is imperative for the African Union to formulate plans on building a better and more resilient Africa in the post-pandemic era. We all agree that COVID-19 has devastated our economies and greatly impeded development of our countries. As we await the distribution of vaccines with a hope to return to normalcy soon, it is imperative that we start also to strategize as to how to build a better and more resilient Africa post-COVID-19. Among the population of 1.3 billion people, Africa has so far reported more than 3.6 million coronavirus infections and over 94,000 deaths. While wealthier nations push ahead with mass vaccination drives, only a few African countries have started vaccinations. Ahead of the summit, U.S. President Joe Biden promised to rebuild his country's relationship with the African Union. This comes after his predecessor, Donald Trump, reportedly called Africa a derogatory name. This past year has shown us how interconnected our world is and how our fates are bound up together. That's why my administration is committing to rebuilding our partnership around the world and re-engaging with international institutions like the African Union. In the meantime, the Democratic Republic of Congo has officially taken over the rotating chair of the continental bloc from South Africa. Hand over the flag of our union to President Chisakedi and wish him the very best as he takes on this task of leading our union. El Sura. No. The new AU chairperson, uh, President Felix Shishikedi, says his vision is to see an African Union at the service of the African people. Also, Nigeria's former ambassador to Ethiopia, Ambassador Bankoli Adioyi, was elected as the AU Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security. Musa Faki Muhammad was also re-elected as chairperson of the African Union Commission, the first chairperson in the bloc's history to be re-elected. All right, let's get more on the story from African Affairs Analyst, Mr. Achike Chude. Thank you for joining us on the program. Let's start with the appointment of Nigeria's Ambassador Bankole Adeoye as the AU Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security. Uh, from your perspective, what's the significance of his election for Nigeria and the continent as a whole? The rest of Africa believes that uh, because that he brings with him a wealth of knowledge, especially 
uh, is ensuring that there is uh, some level of uh, uh, regional security, uh, something that uh, Nigeria has been trying to do for some time within the country and uh, within the West African subregion, and that this wealth of experience can also be brought back to the rest of Africa. So I think that is significant for Nigeria because it's also going to leverage on his position as the uh, head of uh, the commission and to also uh, uh, pool resources uh, as well as the political will from the rest of uh, Africa to where they uh, try to um, engage uh, the uh, insecurity in the country and in the West African subregion. And I think that that, that can be leverage on that seriously. Well, it turns out that one of the burning issues in Africa at the moment is the crisis in Ethiopia's Tigray region. The Ethiopian government has so far refused any outside mediation, although there are reports of Eritrean troops uh, fighting in Tigray. However, the UN has warned repeatedly that the situation in the region is dire. How can the African Union handle this crisis? Well, it's unfortunate, and I think the irony of uh, the whole situation is the fact that uh, Adi, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, is a Nobel Prize winner in 2019 uh, for his um, approach to ensuring that uh, there is peace in the African continent. And now he has uh, instability in his own country, and uh, he's not been able to uh, uh, handle the situation, I want to say, properly. Of course, the African Union um, has been involved in the uh, process of bringing about this. Uh, I, I think in a way, uh, he, the Prime Minister, I think believes that the battle can be won more at the, you know, in, the, in the war front, you know, rather than mediation. But it must be clear that um, and we all know that every battle eventually ends up at the negotiating table. And, and, and I think that that is what I want to see. All manners of uh, problems that are written as a result, especially the serious crisis. You know, uh, the African Union, I think, is doing their best right now. Even though, as the Ministry of State has stated that Ethiopia had a right to, to, to ensure internal unity, coercion, and stability within the territory. But the African Union has also recognized the fact that there has brought about all kinds of execution, especially to Nigeria, and that they are working on it. So they think they need to do more. They need to put much more pressure on the Ethiopian government uh, to ensure that, uh, that uh, he can come to the negotiating table and also bring it at the level time. Uh, because even outside the military victory has been achieved, uh, if, if there's no equity, if there's no justice at the end of the day, if people feel short change, then they are going to engage in unorthodox uh, conflict. And that is something that the Ethiopian government are not able to handle. So he needs to listen to the African government, he needs to do more with the African government. All right, let's wind down with this one. Uh, Cyril Ramaphosa has handed over the presidency of the AU to President Felix Tshisekedi of DR Congo. What can we expect from his tenure? Well, I think what he has to do is just to continue from where Cyril Ramaphosa has left off. Ramaphosa has been involved, for instance, in the, in the area of uh, this uh, COVID the pandemic that has ravaged the world, the, the continent of Africa has not been an exception. And so, uh, he has been involved in the battle to ensure that uh, Africa has vaccine. And there's a three year ruling plan uh, for the African Union to ensure that about 60% of the African uh, population is vaccinated in three years from. And I think, uh, apart from that, over about 600 million doses from what we have planned uh, have uh, been uh, purchased for Africa, uh, for all world distribution to African countries. But of course, we also know that there are all kinds of uh, issues, especially infrastructural issues. With regards to storage of this and this particular vaccine. But beyond that, again, is the fact that there are also all kinds of conflicts around the African continent. We have you know, one in the marriage and also in the public institute, Egypt and Sudan, and over the time, the African Union is involved in the decision to ensure that there is not a problem to that situation. All right, then, African Affairs Analyst Achike Jude, thank you for joining us today on Africa 54. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. After the break, piracy in West Africa's Gulf of Guinea. What's driving a rise in incidents? What are the pirates and what is being done about it?
Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. The kidnapping recently of 15 sailors highlights rising incidents of piracy in West Africa's Gulf of Guinea. But who are the pirates? Why are there more attacks and what is being done about it? David Doyle explains. Pirates have been stepping up attacks in West Africa's Gulf of Guinea, most recently killing one sailor and kidnapping 15 from a Turkish container ship. But who are the pirates? Why have attacks increased and what is being done about it? Experts say the pirates come from Nigeria's turbulent Niger Delta, a region that produces the bulk of the country's petroleum but is also underdeveloped, scarred by pollution and has high unemployment. Last year's oil price crash and Nigeria's second recession in five years have worsened the economic hardship. Illegal activities such as oil theft and piracy are a lure for those desperate for money, and the creeks that snake through the swampy region provide an escape route and place to hide kidnapped crew. Those who once stole cargo or siphoned oil have also discovered that companies will pay large sums in ransom. The International Maritime Bureau has tracked a steady increase in kidnappings over recent years, and during 2020, pirates in the Gulf seized 130 seafarers in 22 separate incidents accounting for all but five of those taken at sea worldwide. The Gulf of Guinea borders 20 countries and is a key route for everything from soda to steel, in a region that relies heavily on imports. Saturday's attack will likely increase pressure on Nigeria to do more. It has an initiative known as Deep Blue to develop maritime surveillance and security, and last year secured its first conviction under a new anti-piracy law. There's also the Yawunde Code, established in 2013 between 25 countries in the region to coordinate on piracy and other crimes. But most countries in the area ban international navies or armed private security from their waters. Foreign navies such as France, Spain and Italy already patrol the region's international waters, but shipping trade association BIMCO says there's an urgent need for a coordinated international law enforcement operation. Nigeria's artist uh, Olufela Omokeko has set up an exhibition in Lagos that he hopes will encourage people to obey safety measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and the need for lockdown. His pieces are made from fresh pepper that will wither during the exhibition, which the artist is acts as a reminder of what farmers and traders selling perishable goods went through during the lockdown last year. Nigerian artist Olufela Omokeko carefully arranges fresh peppers on wooden boards hanging in a bare room. Instead of providing spice in a meal, he wants them to encourage people to obey measures that will stop the spread of the coronavirus. His pieces, comprising of red, yellow and green peppers mounted on boards and tomatoes hanging from nets, will rot during the lifespan of the exhibition in the city of Lagos. The 30-year-old artist says the decay reflects the food wasted during lockdowns last year. I created this art piece as a reflection of the struggle, of the scarcity, the inflation and numerous challenges that we experienced at the early stage of the, of the pandemic. Lockdowns were imposed from late March until early May last year in Lagos, Nigeria's commercial hub and the capital Abuja. Omokeko fears authorities may enforce more lockdowns as the country grapples with a second wave of COVID-19 infections, which has seen the number of cases rise sharply in recent weeks. For me, I'm not wasting. I'm not wasting this material. I'm using it to raise the conscious, the consciousness of the masses. Public health officials have repeatedly warned that Nigerians are failing to heed guidance on observing social distancing and wearing masks. Omokeko hopes the sight of rotten peppers, oozing liquids, and pungent smell will provide a visceral warning of what may happen if safety advice is ignored. It's time now for a short break. We'd like to remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channels web. Still to come, a boost for Egypt's tourism sector. As European tourists head to warmer climates, Egypt begins to recover revenue missed in 2020. 
Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. The pro-democracy group Freedom House has released a report detailing how countries such as China, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, and Turkey systematically employ violence and intimidation against exiles and diaspora to silence dissent beyond their borders. VOA's diplomatic correspondent Sinisein reports. The world recoiled in horror when prominent journalist and U.S. resident Jamal Khashoggi was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October 2018. Khashoggi became the face of a practice known as transnational repression, when a dissident flees a country yet still faces persecution in exile. Freedom House released a report Thursday documenting the practice. The report is really our effort to try to describe the global scale and scope of this phenomenon uh, and to put some numbers and to put some figures and to put some faces uh, behind something that happens to many people all around the world. The report says there have been at least 608 cases of transnational repression since 2014, including assassinations, abductions, assaults, detentions, and unlawful deportations. It includes case studies of six leading states that target exiles and diaspora communities, China, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Even high-profile dissidents are targets of authoritarian leaders in a practice that Freedom House says has been normalized. Not only the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, um, but for instance, the kidnapping of Paul Rusesa Bagina, uh, a very famous Rwandan activist who was living abroad, who was kidnapped in August. Uh, the kidnapping of multiple Iranian dissidents uh, in the last year. Uh, the assassination uh, repeatedly of Chechens, especially in Europe, by Russian authorities. Another prominent case is Lujain al Hudlo, a Saudi activist who helped win the right for women to drive. She was kidnapped from the United Arab Emirates in 2018 and imprisoned in Saudi Arabia, where she says she is being tortured. To help stop such cases, the report urges democratic nations, including the United States, to review their asylum, deportation, and rendition policies to prevent future repression. Cindy Sane, VOA News. Egypt's tourism sector is currently experiencing a boost as European tourists fleeing the harsh winter in their countries have been flocking to the northern African country. This comes weeks after the central bank revealed that revenues from tourism plunged to $801 million in July to September 2020 from $4.2 billion a year earlier. Holidaymakers are escaping cold winters and lockdowns in Europe to Egypt's sunny beaches, where officials say despite the low rate of coronavirus cases, occupancy levels remain lower than before the pandemic. We put very strict standards for uh, the safety and hygiene. Uh, I hope if you can have a look uh, in all hotels about the safety measures. And uh, plus, we don't allow any client to come, any guest to come without the PCR. Plus we do a lot of uh, tests, PCR tests to our employees. So we are trying to be as safe as we can. Uh, nobody can guarantee everything, but we are doing our best. The capacity is 50%. The social distance here is very important the face mask. So we are doing everything. Meanwhile, we are trying to let the people enjoy their time. The tourism sector was hit by the pandemic and collapsed last year, with only 3 million tourists visiting the country in 2020, a mere 23% of the number in 2019. Egypt gradually reopened to international flights in June after stopping most of them in mid-March. But with hotels at a 50% occupancy rate, chairman of South Sinai's Investor Association, Tema Makram, says they are limited to welcoming tourists from countries that have not imposed any travel restrictions on their citizens. Unfortunately, we have only the nationality that are allowed to travel. So mostly are Ukrainian, uh, Belarusian, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, some Armenian. So. It's not a lot of countries, plus some domestic, of course, 
the, the people, the Egyptians themselves, who, who, who love to, to come and spend the vacations here. Tourism from Ukraine had resumed in July 2020 when the minister had announced the resumption of inbound tourism to three governorates, South Sinai, the Red Sea and Masa, Mothru, and which were selected for having witnessed the lowest number of coronavirus cases in Egypt at the time. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> After Ukraine winter, it's really great and I can't imagine and I can't understand actually that I'm in Egypt. I'm in a suit where I'm here. <laughs> Egypt has recorded a total of 169,640 cases and 9,651 deaths, according to government data. Ten innovative and growth-driven startups in Africa received the Builders of Africa's Future Awards in Silicon Valley. The winners, selected from across the continent, address challenges unique to the African socioeconomic climate. The Builders of Africa's Future Award is the brainchild of the African Diaspora Network in partnership with the United States African Development Foundation and the Miller Center for Entrepreneurship at the Santa Clara University. According to Almas Negash, founder and executive director of the African Diaspora Network, the 2021 cohort shows incredible resilience, especially amid the COVID-19 pandemic. VOA's Azuma Kompaori had an opportunity to speak with her. In 2018, we realized that we want to do something more, not just only get people together. We really want to bring grassroots uh, social entrepreneurs and business entrepreneurs from Africa. And we call that program Builders of Africa's Future. These are entrepreneurs in the sectors of healthcare, education, uh, renewable energy, fintech. Um, they are doing what they can, but we, they also need access to additional funding. We also uh, are lucky this year uh, in partnership with the U.S. Africa Development Foundation. Each one of the uh, awardees will get five thousand uh, dollars seed funding uh, at the uh, uh, at the. Um, awardee ceremony, they will be awarded. Um, and what we're doing is, what we're hoping is others will join USADF and really uh, uh, try to look at these ventures and invest in them, uh, especially those in Silicon Valley. We're encouraging them uh, to invest directly in grassroots-led uh, organizations in Africa. So that celebration is on January 27th. Our goal is to not just only amplify the work they do, but really also bring, uh, we've invited several uh, local and national investors and global investors to come. What is it about the African community that needs to improve in order to have access to all of this? One, we have to recognize that we're not going to get the funding right away. We need to work very hard. We need to work hard. So I'm going to talk in the in the uh, in the example of uh, the builders of Africa's future. Remember, these are entrepreneurs coming from the continent to the Silicon Valley. Why? Because we want to invest in grassroots-led organizations in Africa, and uh, we as diasporans, if nothing. We could just be there for them and either mentoring, partnering, providing them access to resources. It's not charity. We're doing this because we believe that these entrepreneurs are the conduit to make a difference in the continent. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channels Television has our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Remember, ChannelCV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chamberlain Osor. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.